Okay. Uh, doing all of statistics. Martin, are you going to do PowerPoint or whiteboard or both? I'm going to do a mixture of the two. A mixture, yeah. So, um, when I first met Martin, he came to my office in Berkeley and uh, oh, no. I hadn't met him before. And <laughs> he uh, got with the whiteboard and started explaining something that was pretty, some of his research. And, uh, scribbling away and uh, it's kind of a hot day so he would scribble and he would erase something and then he'd you know, do something like this and <laughs> this and uh, so at the end of the half an hour I had this guy who was pretty intense and with war paint all over him <laughs> sweating and standing there with this thing, this weapon and so I started edging toward the door. <laughs> uh, anyway, so as the years have gone by he's no less intense but he erases less so uh, I think we should be safe today. All right. Okay, thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Um, it's one of the joys of being a former postdoc of Mike. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks to the organizers for um, putting together this workshop in the Simons Institute. It's, it's really exciting to, to see everyone here, and it's, I think it's a really great thing for Berkeley campus and um, for this area more, more broadly. So as Mike said, I'm going to give some primers on, on statistics, but um, I won't be quite as ambitious as Larry Wasserman, who has a book on all the statistics. I'm going to focus fairly narrowly on what's called high-dimensional statistics. Um, this is probably one of the more active areas within the, the statistical community these days, and it's particularly relevant for this sort of broad workshop on, on big data and so on. Um, the techniques used are very much also connected to things we've heard in past um, talks, for instance, the concentration results that Joel Tropp uh, mentioned. The focus here is very much on non-asymptotic theory, so that involves tail bounds and techniques of that form. Okay, so what do we mean by high-dimensional statistics? Um, well, what do we not mean by high-dimensional statistics? What we don't mean is sort of the classical story that you'll see in a, in a standard statistics book, which is you have some model, it has some number of parameters, let's say d, and then you sample repeatedly from that model, maybe you take n samples, and you let n go to infinity with the model fixed. All right, and then you ask questions about what happens to certain estimators, to the sample mean, to maybe some more interesting estimators, a regression estimate, a, a maximum likely estimate. What happens is n gets large, but the model stays fixed. All right, so here you have all these classical results in probability that underlie the theory, things like law of large numbers, central limit theory, um, and so on. So the question to ask is, if we're in an era of big data and you're looking at a model where d is 1,000 and n is 1,000, let's say, um, that can be optimistic for some models. Sometimes we might have n at 200 and d 1,000. Um, it's not that this theory is incorrect, but do you think it's going to give accurate predictions? And quite often it doesn't. And so what one wants to do in high-dimensional theory is you want theory that um, doesn't just take limits as n goes to infinity, um, some forms of it take limits as both n and d go to infinity, and other theory is actually non-asymptotic. It will give results for all n and d. Okay, so that's the broad flavor here. You don't want asymptotic theory. You don't want fixed models. You want to actually study sequences of models, and you allow the complexity of the model to actually grow as your sample size grows. Um, I think David Donahoe put it very well in one of his lectures that high-dimensional problems have both curses and, and blessings. Um, the curses, I think, are, are familiar to everybody. You have exponential com explosions in computational complexity um, of many estimators. Uh, similar explosions in statistics, the number of samples you might need. So these can be challenges. But a blessing that you have is concentration of measure. So that's essentially that many high-dimensional phenomena are very predictable, much more so than, than you, you might expect naively. Okay, so um, broadly speaking, what are the questions that people are asking? Um, these are very broad questions, but one that it's being asked in many different contexts are, if we really have high dimensional data, and let's actually imagine that the dimension D in which the data lives is quite a bit larger than the sample size, then generically there's, there's many lower bounds. There are many kinds of impossibility theorems that say you can't do anything. So in those regimes, the right question to ask is, what kind of low-dimensional structure do typical data sets have? 
and how can we exploit that um, algorithmically? Um, so sparsity is, is a very common one. That's what Ben was talking about in his last lecture. Um, but of course, there's many others. There's low rank structure, there's manifold structure, there's graphical structure to data. So there's all sorts of low, rec um, low dimensional structure. And the issue is how do we model it? Um, what models are reasonable for data? And how do we make use of it both computationally and statistically? OK. So, um, so I'd say, I said that high dimensional statistics has gotten very sort of hot. It's very active. Um, but just to be fair, actually, the, the ideas in it are quite old. Um, they date back to Kolmogorov, at least in the 60s. Um, so here's a cute little problem, a very simple problem, um, just a classification problem. Suppose I give you two data sets, one set of samples X from class A and another set X twiddle of samples from class B. Um, these are labeled samples. You know that which is from A and which is from B. And what you'd like to do is you'd like to find a, a discriminant function, some kind of function that separates these. And you'd like to use it so that if I gave you a future unlabeled sample, you'd like to classify it as, as belonging to A or B. OK, so in the low dimensional setting, this is very well understood. It's, it's a classical problem. Um, let's just say very simple, if you had Gaussian data, if these were modeled as Gaussian clusters with some covariance, let's say a shared covariance sigma, and some mean vectors, let's say mu a and mu b, um, then the best decision boundary is, is essentially linear. It's basically looking at the error vector between the two means. You're projecting onto that, and you're using that to discriminate. Um, but of course, in practice, we don't know the means. Um, the plug-in principle in statistics, a simple application would say, well, just estimate the means using the sample versions. And so you'd have the same rule, except you plug in sample means and covariances. And in a classical analysis where everything stays fixed, the dimension stays fixed, um, you can analyze this pretty easily. As n gets, goes to infinity, you can ask, what's the probability that I make a mistake on a new unlabeled sample that is given to you? Um, it's going to converge to the tail function of a normal distribution, and it's going to depend on the mean separation. If the means are far apart, the problem's easier. Now, what Cole McGraw asked is a more interesting question, and it's a testament to his genius that he asked this um, over 50 years ago. He asked, um, what happens if instead of letting n go to infinity and fixing dimension, um, we let the two sample sizes for the two classes go to infinity, but we allow their ratio to go to some number alpha? OK, so think of alpha. In the classical case, alpha is 0. You're fixing d, and you let n scale. Here we're interested in alpha strictly positive. Right, so alpha is sort of a fraction, a ratio of your um, samples to your dimension. Now you can ask, well, do I sort of think this kind of asymptotic prediction will be accurate under scalings in which somehow the number of dimensions is a constant fraction of the sample size? Um, and you can test that. Um, if you just implement this estimator, you implement it as a function of the mean shift, how far the means are separated. Uh, you look at the error probability. Um, the classical prediction is this curve. The error probability drops as the means grow. Um, what you actually see in high dimensions in the Kolmogorov regimes, you see this curve. Um, so you're, you're, you're being overconfident. You're, you think your estimator is much more accurate than it is. And why is that happening? Well, it's happening because the classical theory is assuming that you're, these things are converging almost surely to the population versions. But if alpha is a half, if you only have half as many samples as, or twice as many samples as dimension, there's going to be a constant error in how you estimate the means. And that's going to make your estimator worse. Is that, only if, is that for alpha between 0 and 1, or also in, if it's 2 or 3? Uh, it's for alpha greater than 0, but finite. So, yeah. so what Kolmogorov proved, this wasn't published. This was just an exercise for him. Um, he proved that what it should converge to is this. So now you have an offset. Right? You'd like this to be big, because that gives lower error probability. You get a constant offset by alpha. And that's this red curve here. You can see that that's accurately tracking what's going on here. Um, and so that, that's a simple version. There are actually many more interesting versions of this. You can start asking questions like, what if there's an alpha A and an alpha B? You have two different sample sizes. There you have even more subtle effects. There, even if you believe that you know, probability of class A is one half and probability of class B is one half. Uh, 
Normally you'd use that to set your threshold in a certain way. Um, if these ratios differ, then the optimal threshold has to be changed. You'll get a, a suboptimal classifier because essentially one mean will be estimated somewhat more accurately than the other. Um, so that there's, there's a whole nice line of literature stemming back um, to, to his ideas in the 60s. Um, let me just give you one other problem, and then I'll, I'll start delving into more specifics. So this is another sort of standard problem. That was classification, binary classification, um, linear discriminant analysis, um, a very simple and classical technique. Um, another one is a covariance matrix estimation problem, um, and this links us to random matrix theory. So if I want to estimate a covariance matrix, suppose, again, for simplicity, that I have zero mean Gaussian samples with some covariance. Um, Let's give NIAD samples. So the, the natural thing is I would use the covariance matrix as an estimate. So the covariance matrix is simply this average of these outer products. So it's an average of these rank one matrices. And if I do classical analysis, if I fix dimension, let go to n go to infinity, then this random matrix will converge to the population thing in reasonable any reasonable metric. Um, but again, what you could do, and this again was done in the 60s by a, a different set of Russians, um, you can again fix some ratio alpha, and we can instead ask the experiment, suppose I take n samples, but I look at this over sequences where n and d now both grow, and they go to some alpha. And so I have a sequence of random matrices. It's indexed by both n and d. As I increase the samples, I increase d. And I can ask, does this object converge to anything reasonable? Um, and indeed it does. There's a, a very beautiful line of random matrix theory which says that if you look at the limit and you compute the eigenvalues, the eigenspectrum of this random matrix, it's random, so you get a, a distribution function. Um, if you had done the classical experiment where you'd fix D and let go to N and go to infinity, you would have gotten a delta function at 1. I'm doing this in the case of the identity matrix, so all the eigenvalues are 1. So if we'd done a classical analysis, this would have been a sharp peak at 1. But here we have this, this interesting shape. It's known as the Marchenko-Pasteur law. Um, this is when you have alpha equals 0.5. And so you can see that it's converging to something that's predictable in some sense, but it's not a consistent estimate of the, the true covariance matrix. Right, so that's again another sort of instance of high dimensional phenomena that happen in, in random matrix theory. Now, what we're more interested in, and many people are more interested in these days, is this is an asymptotic result. It talks about the entire shape of the distribution. That's very beautiful. Um, but many people are, are quite interested in, in tail effects. So they're interested, this is the maximum eigenvalue of that random matrix you'd like to understand what's the probability that it deviates by a certain amount um, above this right extreme. Or similarly, this is the minimum eigenvalue of that random matrix. What can we say about the fluctuations? Did I do that? No. Okay, well, I'll use the whiteboard. We'll be adaptive. So this is sort of connected to some things that Ben was mentioning, but what many people are interested in. Right, so if we plug that in in this case, in this case d over n is alpha, this is saying if I compute 1 plus 1 over square root 2, which is what? I think it should be 2.9 something. It's saying the probability that this singular value deviates much above that is exponentially small. Right, so it's sort of answering a very precise question about the tail behavior of that random matrix. Okay, so this kind of result, these are, are classical results. I think a good place to read about them is in Davidson and Sarek. Um, so one place, and the other place, uh, Vershinin has some very nice notes on non-asymptotic random matrix theory, um, which would cover this as, as one of the first results. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe if you can just follow along on the two slides uh, there. Um, 
OK, so th this kind of phenomenon, um, I could replace this with a more general matrix and the results of this form that would hold. But this sort of ratio is fundamental. It's unavoidable. So if you do what's called minimax theory, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later in the lectures, namely you sort of ask, if I'm given n samples, what's the best possible estimator of the covariance matrix? Can I estimate it to accuracy that's much better than, than root d over n in, in terms of operator norm? Um, it's not possible to do. There's no estimator that will estimate, well in this case it is, because this is a very structured matrix, but for a, a general matrix you cannot estimate it more accurately than root d over n in operator norm. No matter what you do, you can play all sorts of crazy games. Right, so that brings us to the question, well, maybe we want to estimate covariance matrices, but if we really do have, we don't have n, d over n going to zero, if we really have maybe d is 500 and n is 1000, then we need some kind of structure in our data. And so this brings me to, to one of my bullet points. There's many ways we can model structure. Let me just give you one that's, that's cute. Um, well, one way actually is to say that the covariance matrix is sparse. Um, this is very sparse. It's diagonal. That's very easy to estimate if, if you think about it. Question? Is that also for the lower tail? Um, yeah, so there's an analogous result for the lower tail that will hold as long as n is bigger than d. So I could replace this with minus, minus, and less. Yeah, otherwise you have a degeneracy. So yeah. Um, the proof of this um, is based on essentially a, a form of concentration of, for Lipschitz functions of Gaussians. Um, if you think about this as a function of these Gaussian variables, um, you can see that it's a Lipschitz function with coefficient 1 over root n. And so there's a very classical concentration theorem that gives you this tail bound. And then this term here, this is exactly um, essentially the expectation of this quantity. It's, it's, it's an upper bound, but it's extremely close to the expectation. So that's, that's where that result comes from. Any other questions? OK, so what I was saying is that d over n is unavoidable. So if you're really in that regime, you need structure. Um, one kind of structure, this matrix is easy, it's diagonal. If you knew it was diagonal, then what you would do is you would, instead of returning the full sample covariance, you would just kill all the off-diagonal rows because you know they're zero. If you do that, then you can replace this by log d. That's a simple argument. Um, a more interesting structure is when this is a sparse matrix, but you don't know where the non-zeros are. That's also been analyzed, and, and people look at various kinds of thresholding estimators. Right? So in, in this case, the, the low-dimensional structure is that in general, my covariance matrix here, it's this diagonal, but in general, it's got order d squared degrees of freedom. But if I have a very sparse one, then I have somehow a, an unknown um, subspace that's of much lower dimension. If I'm only interested if, in if you what? have an invertible positive, positive matrix sigma, if you, and you're only interested in relative error of the eigenvalues, it's in, ev in every direction, it must be more or less doing the same thing. The empirical average must be doing the same thing as the real matrix. Then you can just convert it to the identity, right? With a, with a yeah, matrix. so if you want to generalize this result, you would um, scale this by square root of inverse sigma, and you could. Right get a similar result with an operator norm and so on. Um, if you want the more general result, um, the more general result is that um, right, so if you do this, uh, I think this might change by a little bit, but you would get that it, the probability it deviates above its maximum singular value. And now the, the right way to measure dimension in general is, is the trace of the matrix. So if it's the identity, trace is D. But if you had a matrix that had an eigenspectrum that decayed fast, then you'd get a, a faster rate. Um, so that's a more general result that's, that's also true. This is um, for Xi being sampled from a Gaussian distribution with a, a general covariance signal. Any other questions? Okay, so um, 
You can have sparsity in the covariance. Um, another kind of structure people have analyzed as a lot is sparsity in the inverse covariance matrix. Um, it, it's kind of a complementary type of assumption. If you have sparsity in a covariance, it means that many of your variables are, are uncorrelated. Um, if it's Gaussian data, it means many of your variables are independent. Um, if you have sparsity in the inverse covariance matrix, it means something quite different. What it means is you have a lot of conditional independence relationships. So the fact here, for instance, in this matrix, suppose this is a zero in position one, four. Um, what that means is that if I look at the variables one and four, and I condition on all, all the other random variables, it means that x1 and x4 are conditionally independent given observations of the other elements of the random vector. Um, so what people often do is we draw a graph that reflects the sparsity structure of the inverse covariance, and this is what's known as, as a Gaussian graphical model. All right, so these are kind of complementary, sparsity in covariance or sparsity in inverse covariance. But there's now a, a fair bit understand, understood about how we estimate both sparse covariances and sparse inverse covariances. Let me just give you one last quick example. I think this is a cute example. Um, so in this example, imagine that we again have a Gaussian vector and we imagine that it is a graphical model, so it means that it's inverse covariance of the full vector with five components, x1 through x4 plus z. Assume that that is sparse according to this graph. This is a tree graph. But now let's imagine that we only observe these four components and this red quantity, the, the z variable, is hidden to us. All right, and what we'd like to do is now estimate, again, a covariance matrix. And the reason this is an interesting example is because if you only observe these variables, if you marginalize out this hidden variable because you don't see it, what that effectively does is it couples all of these variables. You'll get, again, an inverse covariance matrix that's completely dense. It has no zeros. But somehow your feeling is, is that you only had one hidden variable. So it, it's not going to be sparse, but it should somehow be close to sparse. And um, if you play around with block matrix inversion formula, um, what you'll see is that the inverse covariance of the x vector, it's a four by four matrix, it won't be sparse. Um, I'm, using, I'm doing this in a particular setting of parameters on the edges, mu is a parameter on the edges of the graph. It's not sparse, but it's essentially a sparse matrix, actually a diagonal matrix, because conditioned on z, these variables are all independent, so that means you get a, a diagonal covariance matrix. Um, also a diagonal inverse in this case, and you get a rank one perturbation. You get rank one in this case because you had one hidden variable. Okay, so that's another cute example of low dimensional structure. It's not purely sparse, it's not purely low rank, but it leads to what are known as, as matrix decomposition problems. How do you estimate high dimensional matrices that can be decomposed into a sum of two se separate components that are simpler somehow? Um, this model was first proposed by Chandrasekharan uh, et al. Uh, they have a nice paper in the, in the Annals of Statistics. Okay, so that, that sort of wraps up high-level overview. So the, the things to, to take away are um, sort of summary. This is a very active modern area, but it's actually not that new. It's, people have been thinking about it on and off for over 50 years. And somehow these are the key questions that are being addressed. Really in high-dimensional data, we need low-dimensional structure. Um, things like I've mentioned, sparsity in different domains, low rankness, um, de decompositions of objects like matrices, more generally of, of functions, things like that. All these kinds of structures we need to know how to model, and we need to talk about algorithms for exploiting them efficiently. Okay, so what I'd like to do in the next part, so that's um, some sort of high-level classical examples. Um, I want to come back to the example that Ben started with this morning, um, not because I love it so much personally, but simply because for pedagogical reasons, it's the best starting point. Um, just looking at sparse linear models and using L1 regularization for L0. Um, ben gave us a very nice lecture this morning in which he, he spoke about a certain dual point of view using a dual witness technique in the noiseless case. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the noiseless case from a slightly different perspective. There's sort of many different ways to understand this problem. But um, what I want to talk more about, because this is what's more statistical, are, is, is the noisy case. And um, what I'll try and do is sort of bring out the techniques that are being used 
And um, hopefully if there's time, I can sort of mention how one proves minimax, how you actually prove lower bounds uh, for all these kinds of problems. In the afternoon, I'm going to try and build on what I've done this morning, and I'll start talking about much more general families. Um, I, I think that the message we want to take away is that there's some fairly simple ideas here. If you understand these ideas, then understanding these more general models, there, there's actually a, a lot of conceptual sharing. Okay, so let's start with this problem. Um, just a remark on notation. So Ben, this morning, was using more signal processing notation in which M is the number of samples and N is the dimension. Um, Ben's half in the stat department, so we're going to have to disabuse him of that tendency. Statisticians always use N for the number of samples. It's very confusing not to. Notation should be sort of permutation invariant, but somehow, you know, you get wedded to things. So I'm going to use N, and D will be the dimension. Those are going to be fixed. Um, so this simple model, it's a noiseless linear model, is that you observe an n vector, you have a, a design matrix X that you know, it's n by d, and there's an unknown vector theta star that's S sparse, and there's an unknown subset of coefficients on which it's supported. Right? So what you'd like to do is you'd like to estimate that vector. Um, in general, the subset's not in the first entries like I've shown here, it's somewhere jumbled in, we don't know where it is. Um, but that's the rough picture, right? So disregarding computation, you would solve an L0 problem. That just means L0 is just a, it's not a norm, but it's the object that counts the number of non-zeros. Roughly speaking, it just means you'd iterate over all S size subsets of your vector. You'd solve the linear system in each case, and you'd look for the one that is, um, well, you'd start at, at S equals 1, S equals 2, S equals 3. And the first time you found a solution to this set of equations, x theta equals y, then you'd stop. All right, so that's, that's exponential time. And in general, that, that problem is known to be an NP hard. So many people, this is a very old idea, have studied replacing the L0 norm with the L1 norm, um, simply because it's the nearest convex norm um, to L0. OK, so this is a linear program. You have a linear constraint set. It's a subspace. This is piecewise linear. If you have a piecewise linear function, there's a standard reduction. You can convert it into a, a standard form linear program. So this is something very easy to solve. As Ben mentioned, there's a huge number of, of techniques, a lot of work on fast algorithms for solving this. OK, so let's do this. Um, this is basically illustrating what Ben was showing this morning. Um, if we do this in the case where x is a random Gaussian matrix, and what we plot is we plot versus the sample size, how many samples I took, the probability that the method L1 was exact. And I do this for three different problem sizes. Um, P here is the same as D. It's the dimension of the problem. So we're doubling the dimension at each round. And we look at curves when it works. Um, obviously, if you have too few samples, it fails most of the time. But then it sharply transitions. And here it's working essentially with probability 1. Okay, so there's some kind of interesting phenomenon here. And the phenomenon's more interesting if we rescale, we take the same plots and we rescale the sample size by a function of the dimension um, p or d. I'm rescaling it by the same function Ben was talking about, the sparsity times log ratio d over s. So essentially, if you have a bigger dimension, then I allow you to have more samples in a, in a certain way. And now you actually see a very sharp phase transition. The method essentially fails and then starts to succeed very rapidly. All right, so that's the basic phenomenon. Um, probably Donahoe and Candes Tau looked at plots like this. That would motivate you to try and analyze um, and actually prove that this is happening. OK, so this is related to something that, that Ben spoke about. But in this simple noiseless case, there's a very simple necessary and sufficient condition. And it's very geometric. Um, it has very nice connections, actually, to results from sort of um, high-dimensional geometry, results from the 60s and 70s. OK, so here's a definition. So we're going to fix a subset. That's an unknown subset. It's normally where we think about that's the support of theta star. And we're going to say that it satisfies a restricted null space property on that subset if, when I look at the null space, and I look at a very particular cone, um, ben was alluding to this cone, but this is a more explicit representation of it. So what is this cone? It's the set of vectors 
for whom, when I look at the L1 norm on the bad set, this is the complement of the support, so these are things that I don't like, that's upper bounded by the L1 norm on the good set, on the support. Right? So this, in some sense, is, is a formalization of vectors that are relatively sparse. Because if S is quite small, this is a sum of a small number of terms, S complement is large, you're sort of saying the bad set is relatively small compared to the good set. Okay, so this idea essentially is in the paper by Donahoe and Shu in 2001, but I, I think it was Cohen et al. that gave it this name. Um, they have a paper in, I think, um, Journal of the AMS. Okay, so that's just a definition. But the reason it's interesting is that it's essentially a geometric characterization of when L1 works. Um, it will work for all S sparse vectors if and only if your matrix satisfies this. Sorry, how, how does this relate to RIP or something? Is it R, is this for every S implies RIP or is it equivalent to? No, RIP will imply this. This is much weaker than RIP. I'll give you an example. Now, suppose I assume this for every RIP is somehow for every S, right? RIP is all, yeah, RIP is uniform across S. So this is for fixed S, but this is the weakest <laughs> condition for a fixed subset that you need. So, so if you assume this for every S of certain sparsity. No, if I, even if I assume this for every S, it's still weaker than RIP. It's substantially weaker. I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, incoherence and RIP type conditions are sufficient for this to hold, and I'll show that in a second. But they're not necessary. They're very far from necessary. That's actually important in applications because there's many cases in statistics where X, there's no hope of X satisfying RIP because in statistics we don't control it. We can't say, say that RIP. X... Sorry, RIP is the restricted isometry property that I'll, I'll define in a minute. So I'll come back and, and answer your question. Yeah. Okay, so let's do the proof. Um, I think it's useful to do. It's almost tautological, but it actually illustrates ideas that come up in more general settings. Um, so Ben was sort of alluding to this. So the error vector, if we look at the difference between the, the truth we're trying to recover and an optimum of the LP, it has to be feasible for the LP. So that means that Y equals X theta hat. And by assumption, also theta star is, right? So let me just write. So I told you that y was equal to x theta star. And because I solved an LP that had this as a constraint, right? This is your LP solution. It has to be feasible for the LP. So that certainly implies that x theta hat minus theta star is 0. Right? So that's where the null space condition comes in. Now. What I'd like to argue is that, in fact, this vector, the error vector, also belongs to this cone. All right, if I can prove that, then that means when anything in this intersection, the only thing there is 0, then it means this error vector is 0, therefore the LP is exact. Okay, so here the steps are simple. Right? Remember, how did I get theta hat? Theta hat was obtained by minimizing the L1 norm over all feasible vectors in the subspace, All right? So it's, it's a minimum. So it must be the case that theta hat one norm is less than theta star one norm, All right? But now theta star is S sparse. And so the, the, the L1 norm is decomposable in a kind of trivial way. It's S sparse, so it means this L1 norm is equal to that L1 norm. Now I'm just going to do a little bit of triangle inequality. Well, essentially, again, I'm just rewriting this L1 norm into an L1 norm on the, su on the support. Seems to be related to a door closing and the lights flickering. I see. That's possible, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> 
Okay, so these are our three steps so, so far. You, uh, this is not cone set, this is null space. Right, so you belong to the null space. What I want to now show is you belong to the cone set. Um, so I know this inequality because you are optimal and you are feasible and you are S sparse. That's where the equality comes from. This is just the definition of theta hat. Theta hat is the error vector that I'm trying to bound. Um, now we're just going to play a little game with triangle inequality. By triangle inequality, this is larger than theta star s minus delta hat s1 plus delta hat s complement 1. And now I'm basically done. All right, so that's triangle inequality. All right, so now I've shown that this is larger than this object. But I've also shown that this is less than that object. This will cancel with this. And what I've shown, if I put the pieces together, I've shown exactly that the error vector satisfies this inequality. All right, so that's, it's very elementary. And um, it's useful because it says that all the proofs here are just going to be trying to certify an essentially geometric property, which is that the null space of x, that's a subspace, does not intersect a certain cone. Okay, so that's one direction. Um, the reverse also holds. Proof is slightly, a little bit trickier, but not much. You have to construct an instance and argue on the basis of a constructed instance. Okay, so he, here sort of geometrically, this is um, essentially the picture that Ben was drawing. This is what's going on. Um, let's just imagine a toy example. You have d equals 3, and I have a vector that's supported in the third component. The way the cone looks, right, so the cone is the set of vectors that whose L1 norm on the bad points, that's delta 1 and delta 2, that's somehow small, less than the absolute value of the third component. So the cone is a polyhedral cone. If I take cross sections here, it looks like a diamond. It looks like an L1 ball in cross section. And it's pointing out in both directions from the origin. Now the subspace, well the subspace is defined by x. It's taking a slice through the origin. And what this is saying is that you just want a subspace that does not slice in any meaningful way, that only cuts through the origin and does not cut any substantial part of that cone. Okay, so that's, that's sort of a useful way of thinking about it. And it, it somehow gives you intuition of why randomly chosen matrices, for instance, choosing Xi from a random Gaussian ensemble like, like Ben was analyzing this morning, um, somehow have low probability of actually cutting this cone. Um, this property is also very much related, just as a side note, but possibly some of you, uh, I know in theoretical computer science, there's um, increasing amounts of work of results from Bonnach space geometry and so on. Um, this result is very much related when it holds to whether you can find sphere, almost spherical sections of the L1 ball. Um, so the question here is, you'd like to sort of find a random projection of the L2 ball such that if I compare the L2 and the L1 balls over that random projection, the L1 and the L2 norms are pretty close. All right, in general, the L1 norm can be much, much larger than the L2 norm. It can be up to a factor of root D. Um, but what's going on here is that these vectors, when I have vectors in one of my sets, the L1 norm of a vector here is, is actually quite small relative to its L2 norm. It's at most square root or two times square root of the size of s larger than the L2 norm. Um, so somehow that this property and spherical sections of L1 are, are very much connected. So actually a theorem called Cashin's theorem would tell you, not for random Gaussian, but for random unitary, it, it tells you when you get this property holding um, from the 70s. Okay, so any questions about that so far? Um, so I mean something that you, well, I think it would work, just sample a matrix and take its um, rows from uniform on the, on the sphere. So it's not exactly a, a random Gaussian matrix, but after rescaling, it's extremely close to it. 
Okay, so um, let's get on to some sufficient conditions. This gets back to uh, Ravi Kanan's question. Right, so that's, that's an abstract property. What you'd like, ultimately, is you'd like easily verifiable conditions of when this holds. And this is the earliest one, and this is actually verifiable. Um, this is called a, a coherence condition. And what it says is, so you've got an N by D matrix, your design matrix. What it says is, um, I'm going to look at pairs of columns. I'm going to compute the inner product between them. And when I look at distinct columns, I want that to be quite small. Right, so if I could make a matrix in which these were all orthogonal or orthonormal, then I could make this measure that I'm showing here, I could make that zero. Um, but we're interested in the regime where n is smaller than d. This, this matrix is, this is smaller than that. So these can't be all orthogonal. But I can sort of argue how close to approximately orthogonal are they. And this is called the pairwise incoherence. It's looking at the worst case inner product between pairs of rows or pairs of columns. And we want that to be less than some number, delta 1, divided by s. s is going to be the sparsity of the problem you're interested in. OK, so that's useful, because computationally verifying it is just roughly an order d squared n computation. You have to take all d choose two columns. You compute their inner product. That's an O of n operation. And then you check this thing. So you can verify this easily. And this, th this is sufficient. If delta 1 is small enough, uh, it's a positive number, a universal constant, this will satisfy the restricted null space property for all subsets that have cardinality at most little s. Um, restricted isometry, or RIP, that um, I was mentioning earlier. So this is a generalization of element-wise incoherence. What this says is it's the same idea. We want the matrix to have nearly or orthonormal columns. But instead of just looking at pairs of columns, I'm going to allow you to choose arbitrary sub-matrices of some size. And actually, what I'll allow you to do is choose sub-matrices that are up to size 2 times s, where s is the sparsity that you're trying to, to recover. Now, this was just an element-wise norm. What I'm going to look at here is I'm going to look at the operator norm. I'll look at the maximum singular value of, of this difference between this submatrix, so looking at xu transpose xu minus the identity on that subset. And I want that to be small, less than some um, absolute number. OK, so these are both conditions saying essentially that up to quite large subsets, your columns are not perf perfectly orthonormal, but they're pretty close to it. Now, if I did this for this kind of ensemble, Gaussian or more generally something that's sub-Gaussian, so that would include anything bounded or Bernoulli and so on, um, it's not hard to show that this condition will always hold if, if your sample size is um, s squared. That's your sparsity times log of d, the dimension. All right, so that's a useful result already. It says that if you take s squared log d samples, you will recover. And you can actually check that you will recover as well, because you can actually verify when this condition holds. Um, restricted isometry, or RIP, is useful because what it actually says is that this condition will hold if you take n is linear in s times log d over s entries. And that's essentially optimal. You can't beat that. Um, so the difference here is that you've gone from quadratic in sparsity to linear in sparsity. That's the gap between a sort of naive incoherence and a more sophisticated incoherence condition. I think the trade-off practically is that this is not easy to verify. Um, it's again exponential time. You're asking me to iterate over all subsets, over all p 2s 2s subsets, and compute all these operator norms. Um, I believe there are complexity theoretic results about this being hard to actually verify. So this is weaker, but verifiable. This is strong, essentially optimal, but not verifiable. OK, so now on to the, the question. Um, so this is sort of, I think, where it's, it's useful to make a, a comment about statisticians, let's say, versus people in signal processing. Um, in compressed sensing, um, somehow the problem is set up that you're allowed to choose the x, right? You're trying to. Um, uh, I haven't told you what compressed sensing is, but just roughly speaking, you're designing a measurement system, and part of the design of the system is choosing these XIs. Right? So there's a lot of very nice work on how to choose good XIs. Gaussians are good. Bernoullis are probably better. 
Bernoulli's with lots of zeros are even better. Maybe random Fourier is good for other applications. So there's a, a lot of very interesting questions on how to choose the XIs. Um, in statistics, we don't think about choosing the XIs. XIs are things that we measure from a random population of people. Right? I might be trying to solve a regression problem and one component of XI might be blood pressure, another might be um, diet or smoking and so on. These XIs are not under my control and it's extremely unlikely that I would expect to have this kind of IID structure. Um, so, so a sort of important thing here is that these conditions are, are all sufficient. They imply restricted null space, but they're very far from necessary. Um, they're very easy to violate, but L1 will still work. So let me give you one example. Um, so let's look at a, this is what's called the standard Gaussian ensemble because it has an identity covariance. Um, let's look at a, a somewhat richer example in which um, I again take my rows of the matrix being um, IID, but I take them from a general covariance matrix. Right, so again, I'm taking Xi from some general covariance matrix in D dimensions. I'll take N samples. And then I'll form this random matrix X, which has these XIs as its um, rows. Right? And this is an interesting example right here. It's actually a family of examples, but um, as we tweak a parameter in this family, we'll see some interesting behavior pop out. Let mu be a parameter. Let it between, be between 0 and 1. And let's look at this family of covariance matrices that essentially has a, a diagonal on the ones. All the variances are the same. But all the off-diagonals are mu. So essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a case where all of your measurement, all your um, columns of x have a constant positive correlation with each other. Um, what you can check is the lambda min of this matrix, the minimum eigenvalue, a little calculation, is 1 minus mu. So that will be positive for all mu, let's say, strictly less than 1. But lambda max of this matrix is going to be very large because essentially I've spiked the matrix. So if I put the all 1's vector, um, can someone do the calculation for me quickly? I think it should be like 1 minus mu plus square root of d times mu. Or is it actually d times mu? OK. All right, so that makes it interesting, because now its lower eigenvalue is bounded away. That's good. Um, its upper eigenvalue is very badly con controlled. Um, so this will violate any of these incoherence conditions that we've spoken about. Right? So if you look at, um, if I just look at columns of this matrix and I look at the inner product between them, it's going to concentrate around mu. Um, this is not a chi-squared, but it's closely related. Um, it's going to concentrate around its mean. It's going to be larger than mu with high probability. And if I look at submatrices, um, the submatrices are going to have these isometry constants that actually tend to infinity as I increase the sample size and the size of the subset. Okay, so this, this is very far from being um, incoherent in any sense, but you could run the same experiment. This is with mu equals a half. Solve the, the program. Um, you see the same kind of threshold. There's some slight numerical differences due to the choice of mu, but clearly um, the incoherence is, is necessary. It's far, some, far from sufficient. What is actually important is it's important that this eigenvalue is bounded away from zero. Right? If you think about this from sort of a signal point of view, your signal is x times a vector. So this is sort of telling you the signal, the strength of the signal that you're getting. If this is very small, you're getting a weak signal. So you need this to be controlled. It can't be zero. But if the maximum eigenvalue is very large, who cares? That just makes the signal more easy to detect. So it's, it's clear that any statistics should not need any upper bounds on, on the maximum eigenvalues of, of sigma. OK, so here's a, here's a more general result. Um, so Rascuti, myself, and Bin Yu proved this first in the Gaussian case, and then Rulison and Zhu have have generalized it to uh, the sub-Gaussian setting, which is quite a bit more challenging. Um, so what this result says, 
it's essentially a result about a, the matrix that we're interested in. This is your design matrix. And I'm applying it to a theta, and I'm looking at the squared L2 norm of that object. I'm going to renormalize it by 1 over n, essentially because this is a sum of n terms. So 1 over n puts it on a, a sort of unit scale. OK, so what this result says is that uniformly, so it's, it's what's known as a uniform law of large numbers. So statisticians, we spend a lot of our time deriving these kinds of results. It says for all non-zero vectors, um, this quadratic form is larger than a deterministic quantity that involves the square root of the covariance matrix and then minus something that involves the maximal variance of your matrix. That would be 1 in this case. It lo involves log of the dimension. This is a little complicated factor that, if you want to get sharp results, needs to be there. But log of dimension over n, and then times L1 norm squared. OK, so that holds with, with high probability uniformly. OK, and so the thing you want to understand is it will cover this case. Because here, the maximum variance, the kappa, is just 1. So that's going to be 1. Um, this I can lower bound by the L2 norm squared times the minimum eigenvalue. So I could lower bound it by 1 minus mu times the L2 norm squared if I wanted. Um, so why do we call this a uniform law of large numbers, by the way? Um, so this is a random variable. As I let um, theta range over all vectors, this is a family of random variables. Um, disregarding the constant C1, this is basically the expectation of that random variable. And so what this result is saying is that uniformly over the whole family, this sample quantity is close to the mean. So it's, it's like a uniform law of no large numbers, but it's uniform over a family of vectors. Okay, so why is this useful? Um, well, it covers many interesting matrix families that are not incoherent, and many things that arise in practice. Um, Topless dependencies, this constant mu correlation. Um, your covariance matrix, you can even sample from a, a degenerate covariance matrix. For a statistician, that would be relevant if we were doing something like bootstrap resampling. You might actually resample the covariates, and then you'd actually be resampling from the sample covariance matrix, which is, is degenerate. Um, why is this relevant? Well. Let's just, let me not put the proof here. Let me work through it slowly for you. So this implies uh, a restricted null space condition, but it actually implies more. And this will sort of springboard us into analysis of noisy problems and the lasso. OK, so why does this imply um, restricted null space? sort of applies restricted null space uniformly for all subsets. OK, so remember the cone that you're looking at, that you care about, is the set of vectors whose L1 norm on the support is less than or equal to the L1 norm. So this is the bad set. That's the good set. Um, a consequence of belonging to this set is that your L1 norm is at most two times your L1 norm on the good set. Right? L1 norm is just splits across subsets. And this is an S sparse vector. I want to compare this to the L2 norm. Why do I want to compare it to the L2 norm? It's because this result involves something with the L1 norm and essentially the L2 norm here. So I want to somehow relate these two terms. I'd like to argue this term is big enough to dominate this term so that we actually get an interesting result. Right, so this is less than 2 times square root of s, the size of s times the L2 norm. Right? So somehow that, that's the key inequality. What this inequality captures, um, the cone is the precise thing that you need if and only if. But this inequality is, is, I think, intuitively what's really important. It's what I mentioned before, that in general, the L1 norm of a vector can be um, as large as root d times its L2 norm. Um, when you're in this set, 
your L1 norm is at most two times square root of the sparsity, and you want to think of square root sparsity, this is typically much, much less than D, much, much less than root D. So these are vectors that are sort of uh, nearly sparse in some sense. Okay, so when this holds, um, what this will imply, so I have that from that result, I'm going to put in a minimum eigenvalue here, so I'm going to take an L2 norm out. I'm going to lower bound this quadratic form by a, a minimum eigenvalue. I'm assuming that that minimum is strictly positive to make things interesting. I'm going to get a constant. I'm not going to track everything. I'll just prove a slightly sloppy result for you. I'm going to get C times the size of S over N. Right? So what I'd like, if restricted null space property is to hold, I want that I'm actually applying it to my vector um, delta that's in the set. All right, I want this to be strictly positive. Now this is a number. This is something that depends on n, your sparsity, and the dimension. So as long as I choose n bigger than some constant multiple of s times log d, then this number will be smaller than this, and I'll get a positive quantity. If you play games with this term here, then you can see that I could also capture an extra over s if I want to get a, a sharp result. Right, so that's what I've done there. All right, so for any vector in the cone, if I apply that result to it, because it holds uniformly, then I get this quantity, and we, we want this curvature quantity to be positive. We have some control with the sample size and other parameters. If we choose it large enough, we can make that positive. Okay, so what that shows is that all you need is a lower bound, and that's why L1 relaxation works for this family. It doesn't care about the maximum eigenvalue. Um, that's for statistical points of view. Actually, Ben was sort of talking yesterday about in optimization, you care about both um, convexity constants and you care about smoothness. For optimization, actually, this could cause problems. But for statistics, you only care about the lower one. So any questions about that derivation? Sorry. You're not going to prove you're not going to give us uh, No, um, but I can ma maybe give you high level what's going on. Um, so the Gaussian case is easier. The sub-Gaussian is harder. Um, so if we look at this variable, we can write this as a soup over all vectors. Actually, let's not take the square. So we just look at the singular value. I mean, sketch a little bit on the board. I won't go through the proof of it, but just to give you a flavor of what techniques are useful here. All right, so let's just look at this quantity here, x theta 2. Um, I can write this in a variational fashion. I can write it as a soup of u. This is an n vector, but of unit norm u transpose x theta. And what I now think about, I sort of think for fixed u and fixed theta, for every one of these choices, I have a random variable. And if x is Gaussian, this is actually a Gaussian random variable. Right, so what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to control this process, which is soup. It's a soup inf. Don't you want to um, so the right-hand side is deterministic, though. I, you're correct that I, I, I could center it, but it turns out an easier way to prove, at least in the Gaussian case, is just to lower bound this variable. Um, I guess, strictly speaking, I'll divide it by root n. Right, so I'm taking the inf here. So I'm going to take the inf of all vectors, 
you can see that you can rescale this and assume that it has unit two norm. Then what you have to do is, I'm gonna prove a, a law that involves the ratio of the L1 to the L2 norm. So I'll fix an R and first lower bound this quantity. And then you come back and make it uniform. Um, but high level, what's going on is you have a stochastic process um, you're trying to control. And in the Gaussian case, what's nice is that there are many um, what are known as Gaussian comparison inequalities that allow you to take this complicated process. It's complicated because the U and the theta interact in a nasty way. And you can actually um, lower bound this by a simpler process that's actually decoupled using um, one of the Gordon comparison theorems. Um, so if you do that, then controlling the expectation is, becomes a two-part quantity. Um, this is what comes out of one part, and this is what comes out of the other part. Um, the concentration is straightforward because this is, again, a Lipschitz function of a Gaussian. So once you've controlled the expectation, then the high probability result is basically for free. Um, Rudelson and uh, Zhou use um, more complicated techniques. Um, Sub-Gaussian, this means random variables that are not Gaussian, but whose tails behave like Gaussians. So anything bounded is sub-Gaussian. Bernoulli variables are sub-Gaussian. Um, usually if you see a non-asymptotic result for a Gaussian, it probably holds for sub-Gaussian. There's some exceptions, um, but often it can be harder to prove those results. Um, I, I'll chat offline with you. It's a little technical. Just, just, just stay on topic. Any other questions? Sorry for the digression, but. So, actually, I have a question about this result. It's a, first, uh, in statistics, most of the time when we are using a procedure for high dimensions, we generally standardize the data. Mm. So, but this result doesn't allow any standardization because I feel that's a very important step for doing high dimensions. How do you want to standardize your data? I just uh, standard uh, divided by each column with its own empirical standard deviation. Uh, you could do that. You'd be analyzing a slightly more complicated random matrix. It's essentially, are you analyzing the sample covariance matrix or are you analyzing the sample correlation matrix? Okay. Oh, yes, that's right. Right. So I, th I think you could do that. The, I suspect the proof would be a little bit harder, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> I suspect such results could be possible. Okay, um, so what's interesting here is you actually prove something stronger than restricted null space and this gets us into noisy models. Um, this gets us into restricted eigenvalues or restricted singular values, which is essentially just a slight strengthening of restricted null space. Um, what you have is you have the same cone set um, for reasons that are, are sort of useful in, in later proofs. I'll allow you to have here, I, before I had alpha equals one, Right, in my cone set here, it was with alpha one, but we're gonna allow you a general alpha. And what I require is I require that you have some strictly positive curvature gamma. And I want this quadratic form to be lower bounded by that quadratic form uniformly over this cone set. Right, so it's a little bit more stronger than restricted null space because, right, restricted null space is implied by this, because if you're in the null space, then this is zero, and therefore, unless you're zero, there's no way this inequality could hold. So it's a slight strengthening of restricted null space, um, but it's essentially close to the weakest condition that you need to prove results um, in the more general setting in which you have noise, right? So we started with the noiseless model. We had no noise. We had just y equals x theta star, but statistically, we're interested in problems that have noise. Okay, so let's turn to this problem. So this is the more general setup. It's the same picture as before. The only difference now is that I have a noise vector. I've added a W that's a noise vector. And um, what people often look at is you don't have an L1 problem anymore, but you have a quadratic program. So what you do is you have a cost function that measures the fit between a candidate parameter. This is just least squares in this case. Right, so you observe both y and x. So this is measuring in a least square sense fit to the data. And then I penalize with some regularization parameter lambda n times the L1 norm. Okay, so it's a quadratic program. Um, as Ben mentioned, it's, it's very easy to solve. Uh, again, there's a lot of work 
in high dimensional problems on, on how to solve it. Um, it's often called the Lasso in um, certainly in statistics, going back to uh, Rob Tibshirani's paper. But, but actually, the, the basic idea has been proposed many, many times. Um, there's work back in the 80s and 70s in the geosciences. The idea of using L1 to enforce sparsity is, is not really new. Um, but sort of high dimensional analysis and, and understanding when it works, that's, that's what the, the progress has been in, in the past decade. Um, so just to be clear, there's sort of different forms of it. What I've written is called the Lagrangian Lasso. Um, for reasons that I'll, I'll make clear. So here I'm minimizing over all parameters um, least squares norm plus lambda n. So the key thing here is that this weight, this regularization parameter is to be chosen, right? Uh, the user can choose it and the theorist can also choose it. And we're going to give theory that tells you how to choose lambda n. Um, intuitively, well, you'd like lambda n to be not too big, because if it's very big, then you'll just penalize the solution too much. If it was huge, you'd just get the all zero solution. But we want it to be not too small, because this is really an underdetermined system, right? x is n by d with n much less than d. This quadratic form is, has a null space. So we need some regularization. We need some penalization to try and find sparse solutions. Um, there's another form that I'll also analyze briefly, which is called the constrained version. And this clarifies why the, the top one is Lagrangian. So the constrained version is you just minimize the L2 norm squared, but subject to some explicit bound on the L1 norm. Right, so constrained form, if I put a Lagrange multiplier to penalize, I would convert it to this form. And by standard duality theory, these two families of convex programs are equivalent. For any R, I can find a lambda n such that the solution here, the solution set's the same, and vice versa. So you, you can think of one or the other. You have a question, David? W is Gaussian here? Um, I'm going to analyze actually this first deterministically for any W and any X. And then later, we'll see that if you want to get sort of concrete results, then you start having to make assumptions, not necessarily Gaussianity, but usually people make a tail assumption, maybe sub-Gaussian or sub-exponential. Um, if W were Gaussian, then this would be just regularized maximum likelihood. That's one way to think about it. But we can think about this method much more generally, not for, for Gaussian noise as well. So you don't have any idea how big W is? You don't have any variance information? Um, we're going to see that the way that I'll set this, say W is IID with variance sigma, um, the way that I'm going to set it would require knowledge of sigma. Um, that's just because I'm being simple here, but people have developed various techniques that do not require knowledge of sigma. The, actual, the simplest technique that does not require is called the square root lasso. It's due to um, Bologna and, uh, I can't put second name, Church something. Embarrassing. Anyway. <laughs> It's called square root lasso, just Google it. What it means is instead of solving this, solve this. Um, it's the same family of programs, modulo lambda changing. So you're not squaring, that's the only difference. But what's important is you can set lambda without knowing the noise variance. Um, that's a nice technique. Um, is there another question? So just high level, I think, just to clarify something that might be obvious to the statisticians, but for other people, um, the minute you have noise, you can't expect exact recovery, of course. And there's many different ways we can say that a, a, um, an estimator is good. Mike spoke a little bit about decision theory on the first day and the notion of a risk function and so on. Let me just give you three examples of possible risks. Um, and it's important to, to be aware they're different. Um, they're different in that you would use one in different contexts, and they're different in that the proof techniques involved are different. Um, one error metric is what's called in-sample prediction error. What that means is you take your solution and you ask, how well does it actually predict the samples that I was given? So you take x, you multiply that by the solution theta hat minus theta star, and you look at the average, empirical average. You scale it by n. Um, this is, in some sense, the weakest error measure. It's the easiest to satisfy. Um, it's appropriate in this case when theta star itself is not of primary interest. What's of primary interest here is you're trying to build a predictor. 
you're trying to build a linear predictor system that takes x and scales it by some weights and returns a number, a response that's accurate. Um, so the point is that you might be able to build good predictors where theta hat is not actually that close to theta star. Let's say x, you know x has a null space. Whenever you're in the null space, you're kind of free to play around. Um, you need very weak conditions on x. And the proof technique is what's called a basic inequality. That's what I'm going to illustrate in, in the next slide. So when you say it's, when it's, I mean, it's, when the, I mean, it's clear why you, you know, you're not going to have a strong relationship between uh, x hat and x star. So when x star is not a primary interest, you say, as an example, um, you may be interested when you have a predictor. Is that because if you have a bound on something like that form, most predictors will feed um, the thetas, the thetas through an x or something related to x? And so you're going to have a relationship between the predictor quality and this measure, or why is that? Um, well, this is a direct measure of prediction, right? Because your prediction of the vector of the vector x theta star, your natural prediction is x theta hat. That's what's called in-sample prediction because you're predicting on the same samples that you were given. There's another kind of prediction error out of sample where I would give you a fresh sample and average over that. That's slightly different. Um, but what's studied in the literature a, a fair bit is actually this kind of prediction error. Um, the other thing to think about, just statistically, right, I'm always writing this model. Um, in practice, we don't believe this model holds. Um, what we believe maybe is that this model is close to holding, and then what you actually should be studying is how close are you getting to the best linear predictor even when the true model is nonlinear. Um, and this kind of error measure, you can certainly ask that question in it as well. I didn't, yeah. I didn't quite understand that statement, because if you don't put any statistical model on W, mm. isn't it true... You can always put any model like that, Paul? Um, oh, I see. You're asking if any conditional distribution of y given x yeah, theta star can be written like this for some... Yet, right? um, the, the issue, though, is that this model is assuming that the interaction between the parameter and the covariates is linear. So you might say, I, I don't actually believe it's linear, but for reasons of parsimony, I'm going to take the best-fitting linear model. Right? The, the general story is what you're trying to do. You're trying to model the the function e of y given x, right? It's a function of x, and we're trying to, that, that's the best, the Bayesley squares estimator, and this would be the best linear approximation to the, the Bayesley squares estimator. For the, for the theory you are going to present, are they going to tolerate the fact that the true model is not linear? You will just analyze the Oracle property. Um, so the theory that I'll present, the simplest version will assume this is exactly sparse, the next version will be an oracle inequality that does not assume exact sparsity. There is a version that does not even assume a linear model, and then you have another error term, but I'm not going to do that here. I just want people to be aware that you know, we're starting with very stylized toy models, and this is useful pedagogically, but you want to be aware what extensions are possible and what extensions, when you actually use them in practice, would be reasonable to think about. Um, parametric error, that what I'm calling here, for instance, would be trying to bound actually some, some LR norm, maybe L2 or L1 or L infinity, trying to say how close is theta hat to theta star. Now, these are appropriate for what are called recovery problems. If, for instance, in compressed sensing, this is what's interesting. There, theta star is an MRI. It's an image, and you want to get a good approximation to that. So you'd like to measure directly the error between theta hat and theta star. Here, you need... Um, you need RE conditions. I'm going to use them when I prove an upper bound, but also when you prove minimax lower bounds on this error, RE type conditions enter. Um, but something important is that this does not guarantee that you variable select um, properly. So what I mean by variable selection, variable selection is, is the most stringent. Now I actually look at the solution and I say, is it properly supported? Does it have exactly the same support as the unknown truth? Okay, and this would be appropriate in many applications. People aren't interested exactly in theta star per se, but they're more interested in which predictors are relevant. So I'm looking at a, um, some kind of gene prediction problem. I might think there's a very small subset of genes that are actually active, and I'd like to identify them and give them to the biologist. So that's really a variable selection or a support recovery problem. Um, this is the most stringent of all three. You can have very good predictors or parametric error, and you can be poor for variable selection. And conversely, if, if I can variable select, then I can backtrack and give you good estimators for all of these. But conversely, this requires the most conditions. I'm not going to talk at length about this, 
Um, but just to touch on Ben's lecture, he spoke about, a, he was showing you a dual witness technique. His construction was looking at the dual of a linear programming problem and constructing a dual solution that was certifying good properties with high probability. Um, there's a standard technique here that's, that's a slight generalization. It's called a primal dual witness construction. What it means is you simultaneously construct a primal solution. You construct a candidate theta hat. The same time you construct a dual solution, and then you show that they certify variable selection. Um, this has been used for, for a number of problems um, in the area. Yep. If you wanted to get the cardinality of the support, would two be a good choice? Um, two is not bad for roughly getting the cardinality, because in certain cases I can, you can prove that it doesn't have the right support, but maybe its support is at most twice as large as the true support. Um, but that's a fairly weak guarantee, right? I, well, it depends. I give you a list that's twice as large and half of these are relevant. It's, it's not bad, but um, this is the most stringent asking if you actually get the whole support. I think probably what's most relevant, there's some limited results about can you give me one minus alpha of the support where alpha is small. So it can give me 95% of the support with high probability. But that I think is a more, a, a more realistic. This is a little brittle as a, as a risk function. Um, metric three is probably not so relevant if I don't believe the model. So yes, you, you kind of want to believe there are small sets of active coefficients. Two is still relevant if you don't believe the model because you are certifying that you are coming close to some best approximation to the truth. Maybe the truth is out here. The best approximation to the truth is here and I'm telling you I'm this close to it. So I think two and one are still relevant even when the model is inexact. You could do that as well, that's true, that's true. But the issue is why do you think after proje projection onto the approximating set, sparsity is preserved? It's, it's not clear. Okay, so um, again, there's lots of theory. Um, what I'm gonna do here is just illustrate this, and, and the key idea you wanna take away is the notion of a basic inequality. Um, this is a name that's due to Sarah Vandegeer. Um, it's a very general technique in empirical process theory. In its current application, it's very, very simple. So if you understand it here, then you'll understand what's going on in much more general problems. Okay, so let me analyze the constrained lasso. Let's analyze this pro problem. Um, just to keep it simple, I I'm gonna cheat. Um, I can tell you how to fix this afterwards, but I'm gonna cheat and assume that we do the constrained lasso where I set R, the radius, equal to the L1 norm of the truth. That's cheating because you don't know that, so you cannot set the radius in that way, but let's just do that um, just to understand the ideas. Okay, right, so what I was doing is I was solving this problem, and by doing this I got theta hat. Right, so theta hat is optimal for this problem, and by my setting of the radius, theta star is feasible for this problem. So what that implies is that your cost function, the loss function here, on theta hat is less than or equal to the loss function on theta star. Okay, so that's what's known as a basic inequality. And it's really just optimality plus feasibility. Um, maybe more precisely, if we do a little, little bit of linear algebra, the, this is the basic inequality for the Lasso. If you just expand the quadratic forms, cancel terms, and you define the same error vector, theta hat minus theta star, then you get something that looks reassuringly <coughs> simple you get that one over n times x times theta hat, two norms squared, it's exactly the thing we've been talking about and, and lower bounding and so on, is less than, this is just the inner product between the error and times x transpose and w is the noise vector. Okay, so that's, that holds for any optimal solution. There might be more than one, but any one of them has to satisfy that inequality. Okay, this thing here, um, in general, this is controlled by what's known as empirical process theory. Um, for any fixed delta, this is just a random variable. It's not a super interesting quantity. But the issue is I, I don't know what delta hat is. My delta hat's unknown, it's not fixed, and delta hat's actually random. If x and w are random, as they're gonna be in a minute, um, it's going to be random. So you have to deal with the randomness and you have to be uniform in that quantity. And that's, that's where these uniform laws of large numbers come in. <coughs>
Um, here it's actually very simple. It's not hard at all. Um, here, to control this right side, you just use Holder's inequality. The L1 and the L infinity norm are dual. So you get 2 times the L1 norm of the error vector times x transpose w over n. That's a, a d-dimensional vector times the infinity norm. Um, if you remember my little proof earlier, because, because I have this inequality that theta hat is less than or equal to theta star in one norm, um, this vector belongs to the cone. Therefore, if I have a restricted value, a restricted eigenvalue over the cone, this is lower bounded than by the restricted eigenvalue times the 2 norm. And now you have something that's looking simple. Okay, now we have 2 norms squared, upper bounded by L1 norm times a noise quantity. Now you remember the key thing we derived is that when you're in the cone set, the L1 norm is small relative to L2 norm. It's at most 2 times square root S of the L2 norm. That's what we had here. So I can plug that in. I can cancel a term. And I now have a bound that's somehow generic. Getting back to David's question, I've made no assumptions on W. I've made assumptions on X. I've assumed X satisfies a restricted eigenvalue condition. Um, but that's a generic bound. And so now the question is, for your favorite model, how does this random quantity scale, and what can we say about it? All right, that bound holds deterministically. There's, there's no probability yet. It's, it's really just stability of an optimization problem result. OK, so what, what I just proved is that if the true vector has support S, you have a restricted eigenvalue condition. I proved it for the constrained Lasso. That's cheating. Um, a little bit more work if you do it for the regularized Lasso. If you set lambda n equal to this quantity here, so that's a, a good choice of lambda n, then any optimal solution will satisfy this bound. Sorry, where did you use R again? R? Maybe go back. Well, where did you use that you knew um, right down far? Um, right here. So I assume that theta star was feasible. Um, and I needed that because to get this basic inequality and say this is less than that, it had to be feasible. So then you might say, well, what if I put r plus, I put theta star plus a little bit? Um, if I did that, that would start monkeying a little bit with this relationship here if, if you go through the analysis. So you can do a more general analysis. Um, and you, you can get a, a more general result. But I just cheated just to, to keep it simple. Yep. Uh, yes, and the point is the minute that, so I know that delta hat is one norm is less than or equal to delta star one norm, and that with triangle inequality implies that the error vector is in the cone set. So I was using that fact. Um, you do need that the error vector is in the cone set, and the L1 norm has this very special property that error is always in the cone. Yeah, so I'm using restricted eigenvalue plus delta hat in cone. Yes, I'm cheating here, um, but there's a more, often you do it with lambda n. This is actually also cheating, but I'll not cheat in a minute. Um, the same result holds with a certain choice of lambda n. I'll tell you in a minute how not to cheat. Um, the lambda n result is actually a lot more robust than the one where you use r, right? Because it's just you have to get an upper bound on the norm. Yes, you're right. With r, you have to have exactly. But strictly speaking, this is cheating because you don't know W, so there's no way to implement that choice. You know X, you know N, but not W. So yeah. But anyway, this answers Ben and David's question. So this is a generic result. It's not probabilistic. But now you can just start plugging in, you know, pick your favorite model. Okay, so compressed sensing, one model is X is standard Gaussian. The two norm of the W vector is bounded by sigma, some kind of um, bound times square root N. Um, you're just analyzing this random variable here. In that case, that's just the maximum of, of d Gaussians. It's d Gaussians that have variance of the order sigma squared over n. You take maximums of Gaussians. Um, generically, you see quantities like um, the sharp result would be 2 sigma squared log d over n. That's compressed sensing. For a statistician, we might have a deterministic matrix. You assume the columns are bounded. You assume the noise is Gaussian with variance sigma squared. You'd have the same analysis. So in all these cases, you'd get a bound that's like this that with high probability, 
Um, your two-norm solution is at most four times some measure of the noise variance over the curvature. That's like a signal-to-noise ratio. That makes sense. If I erased log d, I'd get s. That's the number of degrees of freedom in the vector you're trying to estimate over n. That's unavoidable. And then the log d, we'll see, is also unavoidable. It's essentially a penalty because you don't know the sparsity. You had to search um, roughly log d choose s subsets. Have you stopped cheating, or are you still cheating? Um, so I've, I am not cheating at this point because what I will do is I will use tail bounds to upper bound this random variable with high probability. And I will set, essentially I will set my regularizer proportional to this times two as it turns out. And the only cheat is I would be assuming that I knew this sigma or that sigma. So that's the only cheat. The rest of it is, is fully implementable. Sorry, I'm missing one step. So you use a tail bound to get upper bound on lambda n? Yes. That's good enough? Yes. You don't need a low bound or something like that. Um, the general result is that you can take lambda n larger than that, and then you just take this out and put lambda n there, and the same thing will hold. I just chose a concrete setting of lambda n just to get a concrete result. Um, I should probably wrap up because I'm hungry, so you must be too. Um, let me just wrap up quickly by showing this result. Actually, this will answer David's question. It's good. So here's a much more general result. And this is what statisticians call an oracle inequality. Um, what's wrong with the previous result? Well, what's wrong is nobody really believes that vectors are S-sparse in practice. Um, what we believe is that maybe they're well approximated by S-sparse vectors. And so what you'd like is, is a result that says that you get an upper bound that has now two terms one that a statistician calls estimation error, and one that we call approximation error. So here's such a result. Um, so what this result says is lambda n is bigger than the maximum of these two quantities. Um, any optimal Lasseux solution will satisfy in L2 norm, it satisfies actually a family of upper bounds. You can choose any subset you want. There's no assumptions on whether theta star is sparse. If you choose a subset of some size, you're going to pay a price that's linear in the size of the subset. And that's estimation error. That's essentially how much does it cost you to estimate um, cardinality of S coefficients. And this is approximation error. This says if you chose S in a certain way, how much signal is left in the residual in S complement. OK, so you'd get the previous result. If your vector is exactly sparse, then you would just choose S to be the support set. You might say that's cheating, but that's the point of an oracle inequality, is that you're actually proving a family of upper bounds that hold uniformly. So you're capturing the result that an oracle would capture, where the oracle is allowed to cheat when it chooses the subset. So this is cheating, but the result holds. Right? So this term would disappear, and you would get something that's proportional to the number of coefficients times log d over n. When it's not exactly sparse, then you need to choose the subset in the right way. You choose it to trade off these two terms. You want to balance them. Obviously, as S gets larger, this grows. As S gets bigger, S complement gets smaller, this shrinks. So this is exactly a bias variance or estimation approximation error trade-off, and you would choose it optimally to balance these two terms. Um, so I'll show you how to do that um, in the afternoon. Any other questions just to wrap up? Yeah? So the minimizing over S, is that, so the fact that the model is not quite the model you thought it was, is that assumed to known to the... So the only assumption here is that, so Y is equal to X theta star plus noise. Okay. Theta star is any vector you want. Mm -hmm. Could be sparse, it could be not sparse. But the point is that the method, the bound and the method are adaptive to oracle behavior in the sense that this in some sense is any method to estimate S coefficients has to pay this price. And the minute that you ignore S coefficients, you have to pay this kind of price. So it, it's called an oracle because you're sort of imagining it's mimicking the performance of an oracle that could take this bound and search over all subsets and find the, the subset that was best in terms of, of minimizing the trade-off. So. The bound is not cheating. The bound is on the lasso. Implement the lasso. It has this guarantee under these assumptions. But the way you use the bound is you use it as an oracle. Um, so that's why it's called an oracle inequality.
All right. So lunchtime, I guess. Lunchtime. See you soon.